we've been dealing with money and the concepts of it basically to endeavor to find God's optic on it. We need to see it from God's perspective. You and I are believers now. We put our faith in, trust in God. And we talked about just two kingdoms and how there are two. And basically one is a theocracy and the other is just a hodgepodge of men's endeavor to govern themselves. The one God brought back to us and Jesus redeemed us into um, is far superior than anything that's down here. It's actually what Adam lost. Jesus came to restore it. The, the methodology of the kingdoms of this world uh, 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 is all sorts of um, types of governance and, and the primary tool uh, in their governance is money. Money, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes, makes the world go round. But the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God, it's a completely different regime. Uh, and what we operate by is the blessing. Uh, if you read the scriptures, the whole focus of the scripture is the blessing. Uh, it was the very first thing God gave to Adam when he spoke to him. It says, and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply. And it was what Adam lost. He lost the blessing when he was put out of the garden and he said, you're cursed from here on in and you're gonna have to sweat and work and labor to make it yield to you, uh, whereas before, under the blessing, it was there to, uh, to give to you. It was, it, was, it was there for you to manipulate and use. Um, and so Jesus uh, brought that, that blessing back. That's what the whole of Scripture is about, the reintroduction of the blessing. Um, and so we're blessed. And this is how we operate. The blessing is the favor, the presence, and the resources of God released on man's behalf. And as believers, you and I have that today. And we need to understand that. That's something we need to renew our thinking to. Because many times we come to God and we, we treat him like it's a democracy. We're trying to coerce him or appease him. And listen, uh, there isn't anything you and I can do that Jesus hasn't already done and greater. And he answers prayer not because of who I am or who you are, but because of who Jesus is. Period. That's the way that it works. And so we operate by the blessing and the thing about the blessing is this. It's operated by faith. You've got to believe that you are. You've got to believe that you have. You've got to believe that it is. That's the only way to work it. Some people say, well, you know, if I, if I get enough, I'll be a blessing. No, 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 no. You've got to believe you are blessed, and then you've got to exercise that faith. Uh, he told Abraham in, Revel in uh, Genesis 12, uh, part of the blessing was, I I'm going to bless you so that you'll be a blessing. The whole purpose of being blessed is to be a blessor. And the only way to operate this being the blessor is to act actively start to be a blessing by faith. Start at some level. It, it is the revelation that you, it, it, it's, it's the indication that you have the revelation of it. That's really the way it is. When you start to bless, that's when, when you know that you believe this thing yourself. And that's how you activate it and you operate it. And so we, we operate in this. It says here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Already, already have it. It's a done deal. I'm already blessed. With all spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. You know, I often, when, when I look at this, I, I, um, I think of all the scripture coercion that we have with people. Um, just twisting stuff, trying to get us to, to, to give or to do something with, with our money. And we think that by giving to God, God will give to us. Listen, God's already given us everything. We already have everything we need. And actually, somebody go to Romans chapter 8 for me just for a second. Romans the 8th chapter. Would somebody read verse 31 and 32? And it's talking there about God giving us Jesus. And I mean, if he give us Jesus, for goodness sake, what, what else is there to him that is more important? There isn't. And if he give us Jesus so freely, why, why would he hinder giving us everything else that we need? So somebody want to read that? What, what shall we say then to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? So God's not holding anything back from any of us. He's not. We don't have to coerce or manipulate God to give us anything. God has already given us Jesus. What more could you want? What more could you ask for? Everything else is an add-on. 
Everything else is just a byproduct. And so what he's basically saying is, God having freely given you his son, for goodness sake, come on guys, you don't have to twist God's arm now to start looking after you or taking care of you or blessing your life. That's not the way it works. And yet, because we come out of the world system and uh, you know, we come from different forms of governances, we, we think we're in a democracy. We're trying to coerce God or convince God to do something for us. And the truth of the matter is, it's a theocracy. Um, you know, it, 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 and we've got to change this whole idea of, you know, I pay a tithe, I give 10, and God gives me 90. Nothing. You don't own any of it. You never did. It's all God's. The whole 100% belongs to him. It's our stewardship of it that he's looking for. And, and I said this, and I'll say it again. God doesn't need your money. He's not broke. He's not. God's not broke. God's got plenty. We need to operate in the blessing. That's what we need to do, but we're not trying to coerce God to do anything for us. We just need to have enough faith that this has already been done, taken care of, and then we've got to start exercising that by being a blessor. That's the evidence that we're blessed. The Bible says, I'll bless you so that you will be a blessing. Well, if you believe you're blessed, then start to be a blessor. At some level, do something and allow God to speak to you and show you what to do. We talked this up too over in Hebrews chapter 4. Uh, the writer of the Hebrews was talking about um, if we're going to work at anything, you've got to work at, at, at entering into this. That's, that's what you've got to work at. It says here, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So if you're going to work at anything, if you're going to labor, labor therefore to enter into that place. Enter into the place where you believe God's done it all. That's what we've got to work at. We've got to work at trusting that God did enough. Jesus did enough. And stop trying to think that we are still trying to make something happen. We're not. We're, we, we're operating out of what has happened. And, and this is where we go wrong with, with a works program or a sin consciousness, where we think, you know, I know how bad I am. I know how weak I am. I know, how, I know what I did last summer. You know, God's not going to do anything for me. God wasn't doing it for you anyway. He's doing it because of Jesus. It's why you sign off in the name of Jesus, because he's not giving it to your credit for what you've done. He's giving it to Jesus for what Jesus done. That's, that's how our prayers get answered. And so, if you're going to work at anything, this is what we work at. We work at trusting God. So, I have it all figured out. If you don't have to figure it out. You have to trust God. That's what you have to figure out. And that's hard in a world where everybody is performance-based and uh, uh, merit-based. Everything else we do. We get a salary. We get paid. We, we, we work to bring people in or you know, foot traffic or whatever. We're always, always, you know, in the system. When you come in here to this, it's different. It's a theocracy. God knows what we need of. We're in a kingdom and we're citizens of it and ambassadors representing it. We've got to enter into that by faith. So we talked about providential arrangements. So, Be yes. So John, John says it very well in First uh, John, uh -huh. I have written to you, Father, because you know him who has been from the beginning. Right? Yeah. Meaning the old men in the faith trust God and they know him. He goes on then to talk about sons and then he goes on to talk about children. And what he's basically saying is you grow up into this thing. The mature ones understand this. They've come to the place where they've come to faith in and knowing him who was from the beginning. They, they've come to that place in life. They've got wiser in life. And, and then there are sons and then there are children. So you're, you're maturing in this aspect. Is, is that what you're wanting to share? Yeah. 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 I mean, the, he says the children in the faith know their saving. Yeah. Uh, young men in the faith know, their, uh, know how to defeat the evil one. Yeah. Right? And then the, fa the fathers in the faith know the one who was from the beginning. Yeah. Read it out for them again. It's in... Uh, I'm, First John two two fourteen. I have written to you, your you children, because you know the Father. I have written to you, fathers, because you know Him from, who's from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God remains in you, and you have overcome the evil. Yeah. So again, he's just talking about the three levels of maturity, and the children, as he said, they know God. 
the sons know the victories of God because they're maturing, but the older ones, they have this revelation, this understanding of him who was from the beginning. Yes, sir. What, what version are you using? Um, that's King James. Okay. Um, the sound, doesn't it also say uh, that childlike faith, though? Absolutely. Where, where's, I, I don't recall where that is. You... Childlike faith there, when Jesus took the, uh, in, in Matthew 18 and 19, where he took, takes the kids up in front of him, and he says, unless you have faith as these children. And really what he was basically saying was, it's a simplistic trust. It's like, you know, on Christmas morning, when you come down and the kids come down to pick up their presents uh, from, the, from underneath the tree or whatever, they don't, you know, sit there and say, hey, Dad, how did, you, how did you manage to put all this together? And what sacrifices did you have to make, you know, to get us all of these toys or to, to get this present from me? And, uh, you know, are we short in any other arena? I mean, is it, is it causing you worry at night, Dad? I mean, what's the deal? Uh, that child's not thinking of it at all. He doesn't care how you get it and what you had to go to get it. He just wants to know that it's there when he wants it. Uh, it's that simplistic faith. Uh, how's God going to get it to me? Who cares how God's going to get it to you? Just trust that he will. Well, maybe he'll use this way. Or we, Listen, I, I've, I've done this for 40 years. You have no idea what way God can meet your needs. When you just think you've him figured it out, figured out, he will find another way of surprising you of what he can do. He can just, he has a million ways of, of meeting our needs. So you'll never figure him out. Just believe him. Carrie. That, that is a discovery of a law that the belief that goes throughout the Bible is the law of reciprocity. You give with faith, childlike faith, you give and you serve. It's going to come back to you tenfold, but you don't have a clue how it's going to come back to you. It may be a wife, it may be a new business, it may be wealth, it may be an introduction to someone that changes your life. We can't connect the dots, but just because we can't know how that law of reciprocity is going to actually affect us doesn't mean that it changes the way that we have faith. No. If we serve others and we have any expectations of give back or if I do this, if you get if I give you no, that's not the way it works. Yeah. Yeah. I mean there's no connectivity no. between anything you it, it, it's not connectivity, it's trust. It's trust. That's right. It's faith and trust. Gary Absolutely. It's just, you, got to develop that trust. And we have to work at it because we're living in a system that doesn't do that. And so this is what we work at. We brought this up here about providential arrangements then and beginning to realize that you just got to have contentment. You just got to understand that God's got it all. He's going to work it all out. Your job is not to work it all out. Your job is just to believe, period. And to walk with that attitude every day when you go to work, when you start your business, when you're... Uh, you know, do what it is you got to do on, uh, in the marketplace. You got to trust that you know God's going to sort it all out. Life in Christ is not a series of accidents; it is a series of appointments. So just the way, it's just the way you live it out. So we talked about this last week. In greed, we trust, and I said we got to stop this. Uh, you know, we put it on the dollar bill. In God, we trust, and yet the reality of it is. We're not trusting that statement. We're trusting the, 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 the note that it's written on. And there it is staring us in the face. And here we are, you know, coveting the, the note more than the God that is mentioned on the back end of it. So uh, we, we've got to stop this. This, this whole, uh, it's what drives us. And in the kingdom, this is, this is the difference. It's, it's our motivation. It's the priority. When he told them in Matthew 6, you know, stop worrying about what are you going to eat, what are you going to wear, what are you going to put on. He said, for goodness sake, do you think that, do you think that your life is all about you having to spend it worrying about stuff? He said, I can take, I take care of everything else. The everything else he talked about, he said, look at the lilies. Of the field. Lilies do what lilies do. They don't sow, they don't reap, they just do lilies. He said, I take care of them. Birds do what birds do. They don't 
Bill Barnes and Pauline de Barnes, the birds do what birds do. He says, if the birds do what the birds do, I'll take care of the birds. If the lilies do what lilies do, I'll take care of the lilies. And if you'll just go do what I told you to do, I'll take care of you too. Stop worrying about everything. That's what the heathen do. Seek first the kingdom and I'll take care of you. Put the kingdom front and center in your life. Live as an ambassador of it and I'll take care of you. So, we talked about God's economy last week and I wanted to run through this and, and get into some... I actually want to deal with, with uh, another aspect of this that might come up in your thinking. Uh, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. God has an economy. So, stop worrying about, you know, stocks and shares. Um, it's not that we don't do it. It's not that we don't deal with it. It's not that we don't live life here. But here, listen, God's got an economy too. And what they say down here isn't the last word as to prosperity concerning your life. Uh, if they run short down here, he won't run short up there. Don't kid yourself. God ain't running short. Owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It says here, Proverbs 8, 17, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early will find me. Riches and honor are with me, and durable riches. I love that term. It's something you need to underline. When God gives you something, people can't take it from you. They can't steal it from you. Now, when you get it your own way from the world, he might have it one day and gone the next. He said, when I give you something, it lasts. I'll give you durable riches. God's not, in, God's not holding anything from us. God's well able to do it. But there's, there, there, there's a, a mentality that goes with it. If you want God to do it. That's why we spent so long building this optic. My fruit is better than gold, yeah, than fine gold, and my revenues are than choice silver. I lead them in the way of right. You're talking about wisdom here, which we'll get to in a few weeks. In the midst of the path of judgment, that I may cause those that love me to inherit substance. God's not against you having things, but he is against things having you. It's mentality. It's optic. You've got to see it from God's perspective. You, if you're going to work in anything, work to, to trust God. And if you'll do that, God has no problem filling your, filling your, your house with stuff. And I will fill the treasures. God's no problem doing that. He's well capable of taking care of you. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessings of the Lord make it rich. And you don't have to lose everything else in the process. I'm paraphrasing. You don't have to lose your wife or your joy or your peace or your kids. You don't have to be so busy making money that you miss the real wealth of life. The real value of life. Miss making a home and having a home and having kids and all of the, the wonderment of, of the blessings of God. And he said, look, at, I'll make you rich. But when I do it, I don't, I, I, there's no sorrow attached to it. So you can do it your way, but you can do it his way. You, you can do it your way or you can do it his way. You can do it by your economy or you can do it by his economy. I mean, the choice is yours. It's mine. But he will make you rich. And if you let him do it, there'll be no sorrow attached to it. Ecclesiastes 5.19. It says, Every man also to whom God had given riches and wealth. This idea that God wants to keep you poor. Do you understand that if the devil thought that making you rich was evil, you should all be billionaires. Think about it. I mean, where do we get the logic from? You know? Huh? It's because You know, if, 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 if money is evil, if money is, then the devil would give us all it. What he's trying to do is keep it away from us all, is what he's trying to do. And then he tells us that God wants us poor. And that's it, you know, just a pair of sandals and a, and, and a camel skin and, and that's it, you know, just nothing. Live, live impoverished. Totally wrong. God does make people rich. God will fill your treasures. God will bless your home and your family and give you durable riches. But you've got to do it his way, by his economy. Deuteronomy 8.18 8, But thou shalt remember the Lord your God. It is he that gives you the power to get wealth. He does give you the ability to get wealthy, but on his terms. 
And this is what I always say, you know, God's not looking to jump into your regime or scheme. Hey God, I have a project. You know, I'm going to give you 10%. <laughs> We're in, you're in. You want to join me in my project? I'll give you a 10%. I mean, I'll give it to charity and whatever. I mean, you obviously need it. They need it. So, and, and then you give me the other 90%. I mean, he's not stupid for goodness sake. I mean, I'd go 50-50. I mean, you wouldn't do that with an ordinary businessman. If you were taking anybody in on a business, they'd be looking for a 50-50 deal. But no, it's great working with God. He only takes 10 and the 90 is mine. So I'm going to bring him in to bring all his resources to bear so that my business will go forward and I'll get the 90, he gets the 10, charity gets met and, you know, we're all happy. You must think he's stupid. It indicates that we're stupid because why wouldn't he go in 50-50 with the most omnipotent leader on earth? <laughs> if we went 50-50 with somebody that helped, we were stupid by even thinking that way. And owns the whole thing, for goodness sake. But we're back to the stupidity of thinking, I'm bringing God in in my deal. No, God's bringing us in on his economy, if we'll do it his way. It's a mindset. It says here in Proverbs 15 and verse 6, In the house of the righteous, hands up the righteous. We need to have an altar call and get just all born again. In the house of the righteous, Hands up the righteous. Oh, I was wondering. I maybe I, I just lost in translation. I knew I had an Alabama accent. There's no doubt about it. Southern part too. Oh, that's what he. I'm surprised he didn't understand me. In the house of the righteous is much treasure. Righteousness is a mindset. Righteousness is a mindset. The ability to come into the presence of God without a sense of inferiority or guilt. Righteousness is up here. It's this understanding of who you are in Christ. He says, in the house of a righteous man, there's much treasure. But in the revenues of the wicked, there's nothing but trouble. Wealth and riches, talking about a man who fears God. We, we'll, you, we'll take this psalm up in, in a few weeks' time. Psalm 112, verse 3, right from start to, to, to finish. Somebody who puts God front and center in their family. Any of you family men want to read a, a verse about putting God front and center and what happens when you do in, in your house? That's the psalm there, Psalm 112. It says here, Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness, it's all attached to it, endures constantly, forever. Uh, this is when they took that offering. We've referred to this twice, I think, on this series. Wherefore David blessed this when he was taking an offering for the house of God that, that Solomon was going to build. Uh, and he left several trillion dollars there for the building of it. So they take an offering. And then David prays this wonderfully wise prayer. He says, Wherefore David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, uh, forever and ever. Thine, O Lord, is thy greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and on earth are yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head above it all. Both riches and honor come from you. And you reign over all. And it's in your hand, sorry, and in your hand is the power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And he goes on to turn around and say, everything we're giving you, you give it to us first. You just want to see what we'll do with it. And I know you try our hearts, and I'm glad that everybody give, if you'll read that narrative. He says here in Proverbs 13, 22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. You need to leave your grandchildren an inheritance. Do not leave your children debt. And do not leave your grandchildren debt. Don't do that. Live to be blessed and be a blessing, but bless your children and your children's children. You should be doing something. You should be thinking generationally when it comes to prosperity, not your immediacy. 
A lot of times people just live for what they can get while they can get it. Make hay while the sun shines, so to speak. I got it while I got it and I need it now. No, he says a good man is not just thinking about what we have now. A good man is planning for our children and for my grandchildren. I think it's the sum total of making sure that you, when you prosper, you, you live generationally minded. So, hey, if you get a home or whatever, or you start a business or whatever, you're working not for you right now. Because a lot of times when we, the greed of prosperity is what I can get and, and, and I want it now. He says, no, a good man, uh, when, when God works with you, he, you think generationally. And so it's it's not. I would say it's. I'm trying to reconcile that with you know, not storing up treasure, not. But, but, but the wealth isn't wealth as much. It's such a much broader. It's your character. It's your reputation. It's your tradition. It's your. It's the the Mark Twainisms, if you will. <coughs> who you were, what you did, the towering presence that you had in your community, and it may or may not necessarily be money in the bank. It may be the legacy that. You I mean, if my great 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 grandfather was Abraham Lincoln, I would say he was thinking about me. You know, that was a long time ago. But it's not. That, I guess we have to take ourselves out of that gold, silver, stock, land, homes, physical possessions. But it's an inheritance of wealth, which is much bigger than exactly than, than this, right? Gary, just one thought on the story of wealth thing. Right. I was reading in, I think it's one Corinthians nine, or two Corinthians one, one book. It's an it's a, the story of wealth is a contrast to a, a life of generosity. And in either 1 Corinthians 9 or 2 Corinthians 9, it talks about the more generous we are, the more God gives back to us so that we continue a cycle of generosity. So it's more a contrast to that idea. We'll take that, that scripture up in a week or two and we'll talk about that. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver and there's a reason for that. Um, and the word there, cheerful, is not, it's hilarious giver. Uh, the word is hilarity. God loves people who give hilariously. Yeah, yeah. If it's an understanding, and then He causes you always to have enough to meet every need. Uh, we, we'll deal with that. Um, I think really what He's talking about here, Michael, is just um, thinking when we think prosperity, and, and, and you're right too, Rob. It, it, the wealth it, it, it manifests in many different ways. Uh, right relationships at home and, and health and a lot of different things are all part of wealth. Uh, and I named seven of them and none of them were money. Uh, money is a worldly thing. God knows we have to use it. So he gives us the ability to, to manipulate the, the, the system so we can hack into it and, and be effectual as a, a witness in the marketplace. But true wealth is, is, is not money. True wealth is a lot of other things. Yeah, you've got to be thinking generationally. When God starts to bless your life, you think generationally. You just do. Yes, sir. However, it is that God's prosper with you. For some, He does prosper with money. For others, He doesn't. But to pass on money without wisdom is a foolish thing. Yep. It, it's, all, it's all balance, but it's generational. So you've got to remember this. It's not what I can get for as long as I can get it, and, and I spend it all while I have it. He says you've got to understand that, that prosperity is generational. You've got to learn to pass it down to your kids. Yes. We're all wealthy just being a blessing. We're going to God's kingdom. How much more wealthy than that can you be? But you, have to, okay. but you still have to live in the marketplace here. Yeah. And your kids still have to do life. And, and it, it runs by money. That's just the way it runs. And isn't the manifestation of this constant ever-presence of evil because we have to put on our armor every day for this particular reason. But you can see how Satan is working to divide and separate and kill tradition and CRT. All, all the division, all the destruction, all of the family separation. Uh -huh. They don't want that continuity to go from grandfather to father to grandson. You know, grand, they don't want that intergenerational inheritance. They want to separate it and cut that available yeah. cord. So this is you know, the exact evidence that this is true is the level at which Satan tries to destroy that. <laughs> you have to, 
you can lose everything in one generation. Everything. Uh, you have to fight for your kids. You have to fight for this generation. Because if parents don't, it, they'll be, your kids will be taken from you. And, and this is what he's saying here. You've got to remember that what you're doing affects two generations down from you. You've got to live, think, plan, and prosper with that in mind. And so anyway, let me, let me read on here. It says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his grandkids. Don't leave them dead. Give them something. Give them something that they remember that you walked with God and you followed God in your life. You put God front and center in their life. And it says, the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. There's a wealth transfer coming if God can find somebody to transfer it to. That's the only problem. You're just finding somebody that, that it won't destroy. And if, if you can get the mindset for it, God will take what they have and give it to you. He owns it all anyway. So he says here, the wealth of the sinner, they're only storing it. Some of these people are just saving it for you. God will give you a wiser technology or a wiser idea and you'll admit that thing uh, easily. God knows how to get it to you, but... Again, it's if you have the mindset for it. But, but they are, technically, it's just they're hoarding it for you if you'll use it for the right reason. It says here in Ecclesiastes 2.26, God give it to a man that is good in, in, in his sight, wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, this is a burden to the sinner. God, God I mean, this, this is the burden they have. He gives travail to gather and to heap up that he may give it to him that is good before God. This also is a vanity and it really rubs me up the wrong way, is really what he was saying. So I, really, I'm just looking at this. There are some people there, you know, and they hoard, 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 heap up, heap up, heap up, and then somebody comes along that God favors and it all transfers from them to them. God can take care of you. God can change things in a moment. In a moment. You know, sometimes we look at them policy makers of the generation that we're living in. Uh, you know, a handful of people uh, think that they're running everything or in control of everything. For some of them, today might be their last day on the planet and won't be running anything in the morning. Well, they're all powerful here because they have the almighty, you know, dollar or money and, and they think, you know, I'm, I'm, that this false sense of security. But, It'll all be over in the morning. It's, it's, it's temporal. We, we run from a different economy. God, God knows how to get this stuff to us. Stop worrying about it. Just labor to enter into that blessing. Proverbs 28, 8. He by usury or interest and stuff like that, work in that system, and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. God can find somebody who'll use it right. God will take it from this other crowd and give it to you. And he'll say, hey, use it for the right reason. God knows how to transfer wealth. He just needs to find the people to transfer it to. Job 27, 16. Though he heap up silver as the dust and prepare raiment or clothes as clay, he may not, I'm sorry, he may prepare it but the just shall put it on and the innocent shall divide the silver. The children of Israel, I don't know if you remember that whole scenario in, in Exodus chapter 12 and 13. The children of Israel were 430 years in Egypt and their job description was slaves. They, they were just slaves. How, what does a slave own? Nothing. Nothing. What does a slave possess? Nothing. What power has a slave? Nothing. He has nothing. When Israel left Egypt, what did they walk out with? All the wealth. <laughs> they, they, they walked out with everything. He told them, go knock, go knock, the, go, go knock their doors and say, listen, I need your jewelry. And I need your, and just amazingly, you're the right size, and I'm, and 
My wife just fits that. That's love. And they walked out of Egypt. They wheelbarrowed the wealth of Egypt down the road. And they beat their cows and sheep and goats down the street with a stick. And not for a wonder that Pharaoh went after them. Because they took everything. They plundered the greatest economy on the planet in a night. Call it backwards. Pardon? Just call it backwards. <laughs> 400, 430 years of slaves. God knows how to, how to plunder something. They walked out of there with everything. I mean the lot. They took everything. God knows how to get it to you. So, you know, they prepare it. But he says, hey, if you, if you walk with me, let me do it my way, you'll put it on, not them. He knows how to transfer wealth. Isaiah 45, 3. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, which called thee my name, am the God of Israel. He said, listen, guys, I know where they have it. You may not know where they have it. You may not even know what they have. He said, but I know everything that they have, and I know where they're hiding it. He said, don't worry about it. I'll show you where to get I'll show you where it is. And, and if you're in the right place and have the right attitude, I'll transfer it to you. I know how to do that. If you'll use it for the right reasons. Period. So, there is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. But a foolish man spends it up. you just got to be wise with this stuff. You just... You have to have a level of wisdom and a fear of God for this to work. So, let me, let me give you this thought then, because I want to enter into it just a little bit of something here. Prosperity is not the priority of life. It's not what you're sucking oxygen for every day, going to the marketplace. Prosperity is not the priority of life, but a byproduct of righteous living. It's added to you. It comes with the territory. It comes with the job. It comes with the mindset. It is not the priority. It's not what you get up for and suck oxygen for in a, on a daily basis. Uh, living out the kingdom as an ambassador is the priority of your life. Seek ye first the kingdom. Not second, not third. First. Put the kingdom front and center. The byproduct of it is prosperity. It's a byproduct. It's not the goal. It's the byproduct. The goal of life is to pursue righteous living. That's what the goal of life is. To get up every day and be the best you can be as a representative and an ambassador of a kingdom of which you are a citizen. That's, that's your priority. And God will take care of the rest. And take you f further. I'm going to say farther, farther. Anyway, I got it wrong. It's, it doesn't make sense in my own head. So, I, I want to just deal with this because of Catholicism. I, I was, when I was in Ireland, it was something that came up all the time. Uh, but just because we had this m mindset that Jesus was poor. You know? Now, if Jesus is the example that we live by, uh, I couldn't understand it. You have this accent. I can't understand some of the words you say. Poor, 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 poor. poor. Yeah. Sometimes, but I don't speak Irish. It's unbelievable. It's, it's, this pollen has my nose completely stuffed. So, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's all right. So. It's, it's always that crowd at the back. It's just... <laughs> and people always bring it up and they say, well, you know, you know, Jesus was humble and Jesus was poor. And uh, if that's the way he lived, I mean, then why should we expect to live any differently as, uh, as the representative of the kingdom of God? Then, uh, you know, surely we should follow suit. That's not true. That's not true. That's a religious error. If Jesus represented the kingdom of God, then he had to walk in the blessings of Abraham. He had to. Actually, go to Deuteronomy chapter 28, just for a minute. 
Because Jesus is living under Old Testament law, all right? He's living under Old Testament law. And he's the fulfiller of it. He came to fulfill every jot and tittle of it. And so if Jesus lived under the law and was the fulfiller of the law, then verses 1 to 14 apply to him. Unlike others who aspire to it, he had it. This, is, this was what he had. Somebody want to read verses uh, 1 through 14 of Deuteronomy chapter 28. If Jesus fulfilled every jot and tittle of the law, if Jesus walked under the Levitical code and under the Abrahamic covenant, then that was the life he lived. Now what we do, and this is what we, were all, we always do, we always go to the scripture then and we try to extract from the scripture something to fit our narrative. And we sort of read into it. And I said, we've got to stop that. You've got to go to the scripture and read the scripture and, and take from the scripture what it's trying to tell you, not what you want it to tell you. That's, that's why we do uh, uh, the whole concept here of Bible Optic, is to go back and find out what it's trying to tell us, not what we want it to tell us. Uh, if you go over to Luke chapter 2, this is a, a verse of scripture that people use all the time when they're talking about uh, Jesus being poor. And this is where when... Uh, Jesus is born and he's been dedicated at the temple uh, over in Bethlehem where he was born some days earlier. Um, somebody want to read verse 22 through uh, 24. All right, in Leviticus 12, it says, you know, if you're rich, you, you offer a lamb uh, when you're doing your purification, cleansing for the woman, having, you know, the, the blood and the placenta and all that stuff happening. There's a cleansing for that. And if you, if you don't have the resources for a lamb, then, then two pigeons or two turtle doves will do. Well, there you go. Obviously, Jesus was born in a manger, and he, they wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and and that was it, you know, and he had the warmth of a cow and the warmth of a sheep and, and the shepherds came and, and we run through this whole narrative of, and yes, listen, he was born there for a reason. He came from glory and came down 
uh, to earth and, and it was a, a, certainly a humbling experience in the sense of leaving where he was to come and where he, he, he came to be. However, uh, you know, instead of reading something out of it that you want to hear, let's just understand. Uh, firstly, the only reason they were in the, in, in, in the stable was there was no room in the inn. He didn't go looking for a stable, he went looking for a room, which meant he had the resources for a room. He also drove there on a donkey, by the way. That's, that was something to have in those days. And, uh, you know, he had wheels. Well, in those days he had legs. But, I mean, they, they had the, the ability to, to go and to travel. And he's only a few days old. And, and, you know, I'm not putting it past the fact that Mary and Joseph may have been humble people. No doubt about it. But here we find in Matthew chapter 2, it says, And when they were come, talking about the the Magi. Now, this is two years later, okay? This idea of, you know, the shepherds and the Magi all in the same crib at the same time is religion again. Uh, these guys didn't show up for another two years. Uh, Jesus is, and Mary and Joseph are still living in Nazareth. So, I know they moved there to do the census, uh, and they offered up two turtle doves, but he's got his own house now, Joseph has, and they're living in Jerusalem. They're living in Nazareth. And the Bible says here, and when they were come into the house, notice it wasn't a stable, they came to the house, and they saw the young child, not the infant. He's two years of age. That's why when they left, Herod said, kill every kid two years and under. Because he wanted to know when they saw the star. And they said, we saw it two years ago. We started following it. He goes, Okay. So anything two years and under, kill the whole lot. Kill every male child two and under. And so he's a young child at this stage. It says, They saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And, they, sorry, and when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gold, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Firstly, we always say there was three wise men because there's three yes. gifts mentioned. That, there could have been 50 of them. These were coming to worship a king. And I don't know if you've ever seen them uh, when Solomon was king and they came from all over the place to, to, to uh, honor Solomon. The guy had so much silver, it was, price, it was, it was worthless. Uh, the guy was blessed beyond measure. They came from everywhere to bless him. When these magi traveled to meet the king of all kings. They didn't have a little box, a little trinket, you say, just okay, put that under your pillow. These guys had a whole, it's how, it's how, Her, it's how, it's how Herod knew they were coming. I mean, these guys just didn't pass through. These guys had a whole entourage of servants and concubines and soldiers and loot and a lot. And they all arrive at this house in Nazareth and then they ferry this stuff in. Now, they become very wealthy after this. He goes off and spends the next several years in Egypt, hiding away from Pharaoh until Pharaoh dies. All with me? Here in Matthew, um, I think it's in Luke. Go, go back to Luke chapter 2. Oh, absolutely. What do you think the gold, frankincense, and myrrh was all about? Uh, even if mom and dad only had two turtle doves and two pigeons, let me tell you, they had more than that when they were leaving. Uh, because Jesus showed up. Uh, prosperity showed up. The blessing showed up. Everything he touched showed uh, the, the favor and the resources of God. Like Joseph when he walked, walked, worked with Potiphar in his house. And like Joseph when he went to the prison and took over the prison and, and, and was made in charge of that. And then was made second in charge of of Egypt or Daniel when he wouldn't eat you know the food offered to idols and ate veggies and went uh, ended up being the prime minister under Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar and Cyrus and Darius and so on and so forth. Uh, God knows how to how to lift you out of where you are whatever way you come to. So Jesus was prosperous his family were prosperous but in that portion of Luke where you read about them only having two two turtle doves um, read verse 41 then this is, this is when he's 12 years of age 
right? There's going to be a narrative here of a story where they, remember, they lose Jesus in, in Bethlehem. Do you remember that story? All right. Just read verse 41 there, if you would. His parents went to Jerusalem every year for the Feast of Passover. Every year? Yes. I well, mean, every, they had... Every third year when the economy was good. No, they went every year. Every year. <laughs> every year. I mean, for a, for a couple that only give two turtle doves and two pigeons because they were poor, if you just carry on in the narrative, you'll find out not alone did they go to Egypt and spend time in Egypt away from, from Herod until Herod died, but when they came back, the, the family, the Bible says in Leviticus that for the Passover, only the males are required to go to Jerusalem. That was it. No, the whole family went, and they went every year. So that meant they traveled up there, they booked in somewhere, they went for the whole week of festivity of, of the Passover, and then came back. They went every year. They had a vacation up to Jerusalem every year. This is the couple that only had two turtle doves and two pigeons. They were now going to Jerusalem every year. To Pardon? So they, they, they did that every every year. They traveled up there, uh, and and looked at, and he looked after. They looked after themselves. So they took up an offer along the way, and people gave them handouts. Oh, that's what it was. <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah, there were certain paraphernalia. You know, JC is here, or you know, T-shirts or or hats or something. Yeah. 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 There's a yeah. Let, let me do this one here, because um, you know there's this scripture in Matthew the eighth chapter. Somebody want to read that? Uh, I won't have time to read it anyway. Matthew eight verse twenty. Jesus made a statement to uh, some guys that were quizzing him concerning some stuff, and. He makes a statement that many times we pull out of context and, and it's only a one-off statement and, but people sort of lean to it and, and uh, teach from it. Um, Jesus replied, Foxes have hens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Well, you see, he had nowhere to live. He just, he had nothing. He just was a vagabond preacher. He just traveled around and, and you know, sort of lived every day just, you know, he had nothing. That's not true. You've got to interpret scripture. What script People grab that and they pull that out of there and say, there you go. He has nowhere to lay his head. For, for those who are interested in, the Greek word there for head is the word kamphale. It's, it's used over in, um, it's used over in Ephesians chapter 5 where the Bible says that the man is the head of the home, or it's used in Ephesians chapter 4, where it says Jesus is the head of the body. The word head there doesn't mean he has nowhere to put his head. It meant he had nowhere to lay his authority. He had nowhere to pass it off to. So when the guy said, I want to follow you, he says, well, I'm not actually leading you to any particular place. I'm really looking for a place to pass over what I'm doing to another. You're not following me anywhere. You're, you're, you, if you follow me, it's for a deposit of what I want to leave with you, not for a place I'm trying to take you to. All right? Now go to Mark chapter 2 for a minute. Well, I, I'll, I'll do it to you here. I'll put this up. In Mark chapter 2, it says, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. Jesus moved to Capernaum, by the way. You knew that, didn't you? Matthew chapter 4. Somebody go to Matthew chapter 4 for a second. Matthew, Matthew the 4th. Stay there. I'm going to go back to this. Matthew 4. four what? Chapter 4. Verse. Oh, so verse 13. And leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum. Oh, he left Nazareth. And he came and settled where? Okay. The city Jesus operated from in his ministry was Capernaum. He moved there. Huh? 
Yeah. He, he moved to Capernaum. That's where he lived. Now, he moved there, so he didn't just, you know, go live under a tree in Capernaum. Uh, he worked in, in Nazareth, and, and uh, he was a tradesman, uh, but when he entered his ministry, he moved, and he went to Capernaum. Now, he, this is Capernaum. This is where he's, li he's living. So, it says here, And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noised, or everybody was talking about the fact that he was where? In the house. What house are we talking about? His house. His house. He lived in Capernaum, for goodness sake. Wasn't living under a brawley. He was living in a house. And everybody knew he was there. And when they had heard he was there... They came. This is the story. If you read this this narrative, this is the story where the the guys brought the paralytic uh, on the stretcher, and they couldn't get into the house, the house, which his house. So what did they do? Did you ever wonder why nobody shouted up and said, "Hey, get that off of that roof!" For goodness' sake, nobody complained about the fact that they were tearing the roof off the house. You know why they weren't complaining? Because it wasn't their house. It was his house. And he knew what they were doing. And he watched them tear it up and he was amazed at their faith. He thought, this is great. Look at this crowd here. And they lowered the guy down. And when he saw their faith, he thought, this is amazing. But it was his house. They tore his house up to let the guy in. He had no problem with it. Jesus had a house in Capernaum. Go to chapter 7. Somebody read verse 17. It's not just mentioned once. It's mentioned again and again. S 17. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Mark 7. When he had left the oh, crowd, Mark, Mark, I'm I'm sorry, sorry. when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. Okay, so... When, when he drew aside, he was busy, busy ministering to people. But when they went back to the house, the guys came in and sat down and somebody went and started put on the kettle and they made a cup of tea and then they sat around and then they chatted. They wanted to talk to him. Go to chapter 9 in, in, in Mark as well. And go to verse 28, seeing as you're there. That's, that's another time now. That's not the same story. It's still in Mark. So this is another time. And when they went, did what they did, they went back to the house. And then the boys came back to the house. And every time they came back to the house, they had a chat. Read verse 33. They came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he began to question All right, we're back to the house again. Chapter 10. What were they the house? It was the house because that's where he was. It wasn't our house, it was his house. Yeah, he was, where is he? He's at the house. Somebody read 10.10. 10. When, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. So, again, back at the house. Back at the ranch. Every time that, every time, so this idea that Jesus had nowhere to put his head down, I mean, nowhere to live, that's not true. That's not true. It, it's well documented that he lived in Capernaum and he had a place to live in. And the guys were there with him. Um, you know how it is? It's like when we, the stories that we see of Jesus or hear of Jesus, it's, you know, the, like being in the woods, getting caught by being turned over to the Israelites. The, uh, you don't focus on that, hey, he went and stayed with uh, Mary and Martha and you know, visited about the house and you know, he wasn't you know we think of someone riding on a donkey in a world of you know you know, cars and, yeah. you know, I mean when he wasn't living in Capernaum when he was out of is very cool. when he was out of town he stayed with his friends but he had a house he, he wasn't stuck for a place to live I mean he wasn't on the street yes sir. I think he was what? He was literate as well, would indicate he came from resources. Yeah. 
there's so much evidence. Let me, let me finish with this and I'll leave you thinking about it. Let me ask you this. How many staff had Jesus? How many, how, how many staff had he, how many had he got on staff? Well, he had 12 on staff. Was that it? He had 70 later on as well. So if you've got 70 and 12, you've got 82 employees. Has he not? Yeah. But you've got 82 people working for you. Scripture says this. If any of those 82 provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Do you think that those guys went around and were not to look after their family or their kids or whatever uh, because they were now working for Jesus? And, you know, God, you know, he doesn't even have a donkey. I mean, he had to borrow a colt and borrow a tomb and borrow a this and borrow a that. I mean, he had nothing. He knew where to lay his head. So you take all these men away from their families and you ask them to traipse around working for you and you're not looking after their needs. He did look after their needs. Of course he did. Of course he did. It says here, for even when, uh, when we were with you, Paul said, this we commended you, that if any would not work, neither did he eat. Who took care of all of that? Who took care of, of the staff and whatever? He did. He had a treasurer. You knew that. Judas, Judas. Judas was a treasurer. Judas, Judas looked after the money. He was stealing from it. I'll take it up next week. Judas was stealing out of the bag all the time. In fact, I actually think that the reason he went for the 30 pieces of silver was he was trying to replenish the bag because he was spending out of it all the time. He thought this is easy. I saw him then trying to take him a million times. I saw him trying to throw him off the precipice. Couldn't do it. Saw them trying to do that. Couldn't do it. I saw them try Couldn't do it. Couldn't touch him. He's untouchable. What? 30 pieces? I could do with that. That would fill the bag. That would... That would put some of it back in, in the coffers. I mean, I've been spending it on whatnot. And, hey, hey, I'll hand them over to you for 30. Silver, absolutely. Yes, I'll hand them over for 30 pieces of silver. No problem. Probably thought he could put it all back in the bag and, 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 and balance the deficit. Only problem was when they went from that night, he didn't. They, they did take him. And it was like, I wasn't expecting that. He went out later on in his own depression and hung himself. I don't think he was expecting it to happen the way it happened. I don't think he fully grasped. I think he thought he could get away with it. I think, I'm only, I'm only surmising. So just, just the guy went out and hung himself afterwards. I mean, why? What happened to him? He thought probably that he was going to get the 30 pieces of silver, throw them in the bag, and this would fob on until tomorrow. But it didn't. And he couldn't handle it. So uh, we'll deal with that next week. He, he had a treasure and a lot of other things to prove that Jesus was prosperous in his day. And um, so this idea that, you know, we've got to be like him and he was poor and we own nothing. And in this world, we, that's not, that's not, the, that's not. A lot of wealthy supporters too. Pardon? Some wealthy supporters as well. Yeah. Joanne, all of these different people ministered to him. I mean, these were, he, 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 he hung around the very influential people. He ate in the houses of the influential. He came, the Bible says, eating and drinking. He said that of himself. He said, I eat in the nice places. I eat in lovely restaurants. I, I go to the nice houses. I, I know all the nice people too, the influencers. And it's just balance, guys. It's just... He could be there and not be influenced by there, but be an influence to the there he was. So it, would really, it would really disturb a lot of church narratives to say that Jesus was a really amazing small business owner with staff at 82. They probably wouldn't like that much, would they? No, it wouldn't, suit, it wouldn't suit the religious terminology for sure. Um, but again, these are just things you have to wrestle with when people turn around and say he had nothing. 
Well, he obviously had something. Why do you think Matthew even followed him? Many of you know what Matthew did for a career? A tax collector. I mean, there was sinners, and then there was worse than sinners. There was tax collectors. Why do you think Matthew just packed up and followed the guy? Where did he see the money? Well, Jesus was out on a boat one day with a couple of guys. He was preaching out of the boat. And then said, here, throw your net over here. And then the guys couldn't take it in in the one boat, so they had to pull the other boat over. And they, and they pulled the boats in, and there was so much fish, but you go, they have to pay taxes on everything. So the guys show up in, at the tax boot where, where, where Matthew is, and he goes, here, you want to pay me tax? <laughs> and they go, where'd you get that? He said, oh, I've been hanging around with this guy, everywhere, this guy. And when he saw the tax that they paid, and, and, the, and the consequence of being around this individual, and then one day this individual walks past and says, hey, you need to pack up and follow me. He thought, absolutely I will. And he went and followed him, too. So don't kid yourself. Jesus walked in the blessing. 